This episode of True Crime Conversations contains discussions of murder, stabbing, shootings, police corruption and the recounting of traumatic events. Listener discretion is advised. In a jail cell in Long Bay Prison, about 14 kilometres from Sydney's CBD, sits a man named Roger Rogerson. At 78 years old, Rogerson wears large glasses that take up the majority of his face and his cheeks appear perpetually flushed. The former police officer is shorter than most. Physically, he's never taken up much space. From looking at him, you couldn't know what he's responsible for. He appears charming, charismatic, warm even. But Rogerson is one of the most notorious criminals in Australian history. The only known serial killer to wear a police badge. His crimes span decades and ultimately culminated in one of the messiest murder cases to ever front an Australian court. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most fascinating crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with Duncan McNabb, a former policeman turned author who actually knew Roger Rogerson, a celebrated and decorated Australian cop whose corruption and deception led to the deaths of those who opposed him. I want to start with the discovery of the body of Jamie Gow in 2014. What was found exactly? This takes us back to uh, May 2014. And uh, on a bright, crisp morning, lovely, lovely late autumn morning, a poor bloke is out in his tinny off the beach of Cronulla, five, six hundred metres out, maybe a kilometre, I'm not sure. And he sees, from memory, a bit of a, an object in the water. So he thinks, I'll go and have a look, because you don't get a lot of debris floating around at Cronulla. It's a pretty pristine beach. So he motors up closer, and this poor fisherman sees what he thinks is a human shoe. I think it was from memory, it was a white Reebok. He gets closer and closer and finds that the shoe is actually attached to a person, Jamie Gow. And Jamie's floating there. He's wrapped up from memory in some sort of tarpaulin with uh, ropes or bindings around it to keep him inside the tarpaulin very obviously human, very, very quickly. Uh, And a horrible find for this poor devil. He does the right thing and very shortly the police are on the scene very, very quickly. And Jamie Gow is hauled aboard, taken back to shore and they realise that they have very much a murder on their hands. You don't find bodies floating at sea very often. Um, And in the great Sydney tradition, which is where Roger and Glenn McNamara made a horrible mistake, we do have some expertise in burying people at sea and normally quite effectively. But in this case, they stuffed it up. And had he been, had Jamie been declared missing? Yep. Jamie went missing, might be wayward slightly on the dates, but he'd been, the week before Jamie had gone missing He and I think two other fellows had arranged to meet some people, which turned out to be Roger and Glenn, in Padstow, just in southwestern Sydney. There is CCTV of Gow and his mates in their car. I think it was a quite, I think it was a Nissan GTR or something rather, quite distinctive car, coming through the CCTV at the exit point of the motorway, driving along, and they're picked up by CCTV all the way along, and then they turn into this little quiet street. When Jamie didn't turn up that night uh, from this assignation, uh, his friends were terrified. They were running around, they searched his house, they went looking for him at all the usual places. And by early the next day, they finally contacted the coppers and said, this guy's missing. The coppers were quite interested, of course, more so than usual. I mean, you know, 20-year-old kids go missing briefly for all sorts of reasons. But Jamie Gow turned the lights and buzzers on at the police station because he was a subject of interest in major drug deals. So rather than think that this is just a kid who's, you know, gone out and got a bit trashed and spent the night somewhere else, they knew that something had gone wrong. And the investigation kicked off pretty fast at that point. Um, And within, a oh, God, probably about 14, 16 hours, the police had actually managed to track Jamie's movements that afternoon using a CCTV camera that no one knew about, a little tiny camera sitting on top of a place called Mixed Meats, 
watching the car park to make sure vandals didn't interfere with the patron's car. What it does, and what this random camera in the middle of a quiet side street in Padstow did, was record Glenn McNamara arrive in the station wagon he'd bought for the purposes of the crime. It records Roger pulling up on the other side of the road in his station wagon, sort of greeting like a Ford Owners Club meeting. He sees them. Then Jamie Gow's car comes into the street. Roger moves off into the car park. And the camera records Jamie and his mates pulling up, Jamie getting out of the car and sort of running at a, or bent over slightly towards McNamara's car and hopping in the back seat. Very dodgy looking. And it was that one piece of film that kicked the coppers into action. And then, then other cameras in the street picked up where they'd driven to, back on the main road again. Other CCTV cameras pick up their movements and take them directly along to the self-storage place about 900 metres from me up the road, where the CCTV from the self-storage place kicks in. Game, set and match. Uh, at about 1.30pm uh, last Tuesday, the 20th of May, Mr Gow uh, arrived in his motor vehicle uh, in a street in Padstow. He had two other Asian male people with him in that car. We know that shortly after arriving there, he walked from that car to another white motor vehicle, a white station wagon. He got into that car. That car then drove from that area uh, and was followed by a silver station wagon. We know that Mr Gow was taken to a location nearby and at that location we believe he was murdered. The purpose of the meeting we now strongly believe and will be putting to the court was for the uh, for a drug transaction, a substantial quantity of prohibited drugs. So Roger Rogerson, and we're going to um, mm. get into the fact that this was not his first crime, but he was a former detective. Yep. How does a detective make that many errors? Uh, that is a very large question, which has a slightly larger answer, but I'll try and keep it short. Roger was a particularly fine detective back in his day, and this is where his day was sort of the late 60s to very early 80s. He was very good at what he did. But Roger was never particular. Oh, sorry, I think it was a combination of arrogance, indifference, and just bravado with him. The first time Roger got into serious strife, aside from being accused of shooting at drug dealers and laneways and such things, the first time Roger ever went to jail was in the uh, late 80s. And he was caught on CCTV in a bank back in the 70s and 80s, banks were open until late on Fridays until 5 o'clock. People didn't bank every day, but on Friday afternoons, they'd take the week's takings down, so the banks would be awash with cash. Bank robbers knew that, so any detective worth their salt knew that between 3 and 5 was peak hour on Friday. They stayed out of the pubs, they avoided going to lunch, which was pretty much common in those days. Roger should have known better. Cameras in banks weren't new. Roger finds himself with an embarrassment of wealth. I think from memory, the total amount that he eventually deposited was around about 110,000 bucks. This is in a period when a detective sergeant was earning about 35 grand a year. So a bag with about 110 grand in it's pretty conspicuous. Roger goes down to first up, I think, a bank in York Street in the city. With the assistance of a couple of friends, opens a bank account in a completely bodgy name. Back in those days, you didn't need 100 points. That they, If you looked okay, it was fine. He opens it in a dud name and he starts depositing the cash into the bank. And one particular fascinating incident, he's there in his distinctive wind cheater. I think he's still got the same wind cheater. It's this sort of beige thing you bought at Lowe's. He's depositing the money in the bank and he turns round and you can see him just turn round. He, the camera's there, captures him full face and he walks out of the bank. Eventually, the detectives do catch up with Roger and they ask him the embarrassing question about the money. Where did it come from? Roger has a remarkably convoluted answer which involved, um, I was restoring an old Bentley Continental and this is where the profits came from, which, you know, is a bit, not even as good as I wanted at the races. So that was his first brush and that CCTV footage sent him to jail. But there's more. The next time Roger went to jail was um, in the early 2000s. He gave evidence to the Police Integrity Commission. By this stage, he's long out of the coppers. And they called him over about some very dodgy deals. Not far from here, one of them was in um, Goulburn Street, a lovely establishment called the Eros Cinema. 
the great crime of the era of cinema was not that it was a similar that actually offered prostitution. The prostitution wasn't the main problem of the place. They were selling booze without a license, which was horrific. And Roger was up to some shenanigans with him down there. And he was also involved in selling scaffolding or renting scaffolding to uh, various councils. That was his business. A legit front. He actually worked bloody hard. Um, he goes to the Police Integrity Commission because there's some suggestions that there's some monkey business with the, some of the contracts he's doing. And Roger gives evidence and says, no, no, this couldn't happen. And this is the classic moment for journalists and for detectives is when you get them to say, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, that didn't happen, and so on. And then you just pull the recorder in, push the go button, and there you have Roger saying the exact opposite. And they caught him dead to rights. They had his house wired for sound. They had his car wired, I think. They had his holiday house wired. They had Rogerson's life in chapter and verse from his own mouth. Uh, so when Roger had assured on oath that he didn't do anything, they just played the tape and Roger was gone. So Roger went to jail for lying. Um, his wife also went to jail. Uh, she did weekend attention because she was supporting him, which I also was quite horrific. So that was his second brush with technology. So Roger's not really good on technology. And his third brush with technology was young Mr Gowan, the possibly... I reckon it's the most recorded murder plot I've ever seen. I don't think there's been any more vision for a murder ever. Rogerson was working on a book about police corruption with former detective Glenn McNamara. He's also accused of Gal's murder. Police will allege they have video of the pair emerging from a storage unit with a body. Rogerson recently joked about getting caught. Unfortunately, I mean, the media have cameras everywhere, there's CCDV footage. In my day, we never had those problems. But what the videos don't show us is how this drug deal turned deadly. The crimes that he committed were, were calculated. Mm. So it does seem bizarre that, that those mistakes would be made. Yeah, the, ga the Gow thing was, I always reckon they'd actually plan Gow reasonably well. But what they hadn't done is made sure that there was no CCTV outside a little meat market. Mm. They'd assumed that they'd be picked up on CCTV, but the, the key point is, had they not been able to, had the police not been able to find the vision of Jamie Gow slipping into McNamara's car with Roger lurking nearby, they would never have got him to the, uh, they would never have got him to the storage unit. He would have just disappeared on that street. And what if they never found that body? Because there are pretty simple ways, as awful as it sounds, to make a body disappear, aren't there? Isn't yeah. that the fact that it was found was an error? Oh, absolutely. Um, making a body disappear in water is reasonably straightforward. Um, Roger, who one might suggest has had some experience in this area, um, possibly not directly, but instructing people to do so. And the murder of Christopher Flannery comes to mind. Um, there, are, there are a number of ways to make sure a body doesn't float back up and, you know, to be quite blunt about it. You have to wait. You have to make sure the weights are firmly secured to the body, which wasn't the case here, and you need to stab them. And that's mm. the grisly fact of it is that a body inflates. So if you put a hole in it, it sinks. Mm. So as a body decomposes, this is a grisly forensic bits, they generally start floating up to the surface, which is what happened with Jamie Gow. Had Roger put a few holes in Jamie Gow, then there's likelihood that he may it was that he may have sunk and we'd never know, in which case we would have the fascinating case of the disappearing Jamie Gow. There was one link to McNamara. When police searched Gow's house, they found business cards with Glenn McNamara's name on them, which would have given them a link, but would have been good enough to get things going as fast as it has. Jamie re-emerging. I mean, Roger and Glenn were already suspects for Jamie's murder by this stage. There was a, an incredible weekend. Um, they get the tape from the, um, the butcher shop. They follow it through to the uh, storage unit. In the wee small hours, I think it was the Thursday morning after Jamie disappeared, the coppers are actually at the storage unit getting the CCTV footage. This is fantastic stuff. They then pull it take it back to the police station. They're looking at it there, and I think this is the one, another bizarre moment where Roger really fails up. They're looking at the CCTV footage from the storage unit, and some of the younger police are looking, they're trawling through hours of this torturous stuff, 
And an older copper walks past and just copper's basically nosy. That's what we do for a quid. And they look down at the screen and he looks and he gets closer and he says something like, oh, Christ, that's Roger. Because Roger is so distinctive. And Roger lives in Padstow. You know, it's only a couple of clicks away. Everyone knows each other out there. It's a small community. And Roger was rather famous. So everyone's got a pretty good idea that Roger, these days, what he looks like and how he walks. And it's very distinctive. So it didn't take long for them to work out that Roger was with Glenn at the storage unit. And the whole thing gets a lot of momentum. All of a sudden, Glenn's under surveillance. Roger's under surveillance. They've got them wired electronically. They're listening to their phone calls. Roger and Glenn have got no clue. No idea whatsoever. They have no idea that that one little frame of film has ruined them. And on the Saturday morning, they're recording conversations. Roger's going up to do a, a book signing tour and his little boxes of memorabilia that he sells, you know, bizarre Roger. He was heading up to, the, heading up to Brisbane to see a fight and then sell some of his memorabilia, which includes photographs of him standing over the dead body of Warren Land Franchi, which he signs and sells to people. People love this stuff. And Roger made a nice little cash business. One bloke said he probably made about 1500 bucks a day on it, just selling old photographs. People buy strange things. Roger, there was a, there's a cult of the Rogerson. Roger's at the airport, heading up to Brisbane to make a few bucks. McNamara and he are chatting on the phone. Glenn drives to the airport to see him. So they know that something's up. And this is on the Saturday morning and it's on the Sunday afternoon. That This is how f- bizarre this case is. On the Saturday, Glenn McNamara drives to Cooma Jail to visit um, a couple of crooks down there. He and Roger have insinuated themselves into the Sydney murder case of, the, of uh, Ron Medich and the late Michael McGurk. And they are involved in trying to get the trial thrown, put it simply. So he's McNamara is zoomed down there to look after that part of the business. He drives back and on Sunday afternoon, he's caught driving. Um, he was dropping someone off in the city. He's caught. He's arrested. All of a sudden, everyone's on the story. The media go gaga. By f- the late Sunday night, Roger is wanted. Roger knows he's wanted. Roger's up in Brisbane having a quiet beer with his mates, having made a couple of, you know, a couple of grand on settling memorabilia. And he grabs one of his mates and says, you know, we need to get out of here. So they drive to the Gold Coast. The blokes aren't aware of what's going on at this point. And he just, Roger then stays in this fellow's apartment overnight. Meanwhile, the coppers in New South Wales trying to find out where Roger's gone. They eventually work out he's in Brisbane. And so... They fly to Brisbane, unknowing that, of course, Roger has borrowed this bloke's ute and is now driving this long 12 miserable hours on his own back towards Sydney to give himself up or to be arrested. This bizarreness of the story. Good evening. Sydney's most infamous crooked cop, Roger Rogerson, is in custody tonight, accused of murder after a two-day police hunt that ended at his suburban home in Padstow Heights this morning. Well, now in his 70s and claiming he's barely able to walk, Rogerson was furious as his one-time detective mates executed the raid. Never. I'll speak to you in a minute. Right. We're just taking Mr. Mr. Rogerson's place, so we can always do this in a controlled manner. Thank you. Just a bit of space. Come on. Come Mr. Rogerson has been taken from the steps of his family home now. Mr. Rogerson, do you maintain your innocence? It's unnecessary. Mr. Rogerson, did you murder Jamie? Do you maintain your innocence, sir? Back to the Gashapo days now. Do you maintain your innocence? Mr. Rogerson, did you murder Jamie Gale? Did you kill Jamie Gale? Did you kill Jamie Gale? Are you surrounded? Are you concerned about the possibility of spending life in prison? I want to go back to Roger Rogerson's upbringing. So he was born sort of in Western Sydney, wasn't he? Yeah, brought up in Western Sydney, born in Bondi. I think mother and father are not terribly, they haven't been in Australia terribly long. I think from memory, his dad was a boiler maker and is just a really good, solid, delightful family. Sydney was opening up very fast in those days. They moved to Stacey Street, Banktown, which then you could build a house and you've got a decent sized paddock. I think they, from memory, they had a horse in the backyard as a kid, a couple, an acre or two. Pretty average Australian suburban upbringing. It's World War II when Roger's born. 
Why do you think he wants to be in the police force? Because that wasn't sort of in his family or anything. No, he was always a bit mixed on this. His father was not a great fan of policing, got a solid old unionist who thought, you know, it's either them or us. Mother was um, just a... You know, just a terrific woman who looked after her kids, brought them up beautifully. He's, Roger has a couple of siblings who are just delightful people. There's not an ounce of, there's not a crook anywhere in the family, apart from Roger. He had a relative, I think it was a, a cousin or something or other, who'd gone into the police and hadn't liked it. And Roger was looking around for something to do. His dad wanted him to be a boiler maker and learn how to weld, which he did. But uh, Roger wasn't too keen on spending an entire life doing that. And I think the coppers appealed to him. It was a different life. You got a uniform, you got well paid in those days. Um, and it was exciting. It was a change. Back when Roger was a kid, if your family weren't affluent and they weren't, you went into a trade or you went into the public service and then you know, just slowly drift up to a certain level and spend your entire life there. Job for life. The coppers offered a job for life, but they offered a really interesting job for life. Mm. And Roger's also very, very bright, very adept. He did say to once, and it was always uh, and a quirk of the bloke, he went into the police cadet, so pretty much from shortly past puberty, he was wearing a police uniform, learning the skills. Um, he was a competent musician, and he did say once that he thought his life could have been in musical theatre rather than <laughs> policing. And he sort of, he decided, you know, musical theatre detective work, I'll take detective work. So it could have been a very different outcome. I really don't know why I, I joined. Um, my father was very much against the police. He hated the police, to be quite truthful. He was an old boiler maker, an old pommy boiler maker. He'd come out from Yorkshire and he didn't have a kind word to say about the cops. And, and not, not long before he died, he still had the same thoughts. But, um, and I had another relative who was a policeman. Uh, he had no influence on me. I, I think I just decided that I would, uh, I'd, I'd like to be a cop. So he then, he started as a policeman, but then the detective work sort yep. of appealed to him more. And he was very good at it, wasn't he? Yeah, but and I think it's still the same these days. You do a couple of years in uniform, learning the ropes, getting, and then you decide if you want to specialise. Um, and he, being a detective appealed to him enormously. He was very capable, extremely capable. Where things, I think, went a bit haywire from him was that he was noted, as, picked out as being someone very talented which meant not only was he good at what he did, insightful, fearless, but also possibly malleable. Mm. And I think where Roger's career went, in hindsight, horribly wrong, was when he was picked as being possibly the new blue-eyed boy of the CIB, Criminal Investigation Branch. And his mentors back in those days were some seriously crooked coppers. I mean, desperately crooked cops. And they took him under his wing and they realised they had a talented young man who was exceptionally good at what he did, absolutely ruthless, smart, could give evidence beautifully, an actor, which you needed to be when you go to court, um, and also a bloke who would pretty much do as he was told and didn't mind if there was a, as I used to call it in those days, quid, if there was some money lying around, then you could sort that out as well. And back in those days too, if you, if you found someone you thought should be arrested and you didn't have the evidence, then it wasn't uncommon to make it up. Mm. And this is where the acting skills came in. Rod, Roger Rogerson in the witness box selling a lie was remarkable. I want to take us to 1976 with a man named Philip Weston. Oh, yes. Uh, there was an incident and sort of this was one of the first times that Rogerson sort of appeared to be implicated in something. What mm. happened? Philip Weston was a... <clears throat> an awful crook, a bank robber and all sorts of things, you know, a long history of crimes of violence, basically a bloke that when he went to jail didn't rehabilitate. Weston was eventually tracked by the CIB. I think he'd escaped from jail or something or other. And everyone was after him because he was seriously bad news. And they traced him to a house, I think up on the central coast, a fibro house, whereupon the New South Wales police, had, they'd just got delivery of all these new weapons. They really wanted to try them out. And they had shotguns and rifles and God knows They literally decimated the house. There wasn't a lot left. And inside it, they finally found Philip Weston. Rogerson, for reasons, i just give you a bizarre insight on how weird this bloke can be on occasions, bragged afterwards, years later, that he was the one responsible for shooting Philip Weston. Why you'd brag about shooting someone is beyond me, but it was bullshit anyway. I mean, Roger was one of a lot of other detectives. They literally turned the house into Swiss cheese and Philip Weston with it. 
Roger later bragged that it, he was the one that did it. And it's not quite the case. What was the intention was that? Did, did the police go with the intention of killing this man? I think that that was in their minds, yes. Well, if Weston wasn't going to give himself up and put up a fight, then game on. Right. Yeah. And he had a long track record of exceptional violence. So uh, they felt at the time that it was not unreasonable that if he decided to try and shoot his way out, then they'd comply with him and shoot him instead. Mm. And they did. And you've made an interesting point Mm. before that it was something he later bragged about, which is unusual because what we sort of know about police is that often it's quite traumatic that the the mm. act of killing someone is something that the average human being isn't particularly comfortable with, even if mm. they're a criminal. Was that sort of an indicator that he didn't have any problem with killing someone? Yep. Well, uh, I suppose the, th- the three shootings that he admits to, because he still doesn't admit to Jeremy Gow, the three shootings he admits to had that, some, that same common thread. Roger was proud of what he did. He bragged about it. It was part of his swagger. Now, you talk to police who've actually shot somebody and returned service personnel as well who've been involved in wars and so on. They don't brag about it. In mm. fact, it's something they live with the rest of their life. It's a thing that wakes them up in the wee small hours of the morning. Um, Roger didn't have any qualms about it at all. Mm. Then in 1981, there was the infamous shooting of a man you mentioned, which is Warren Land Franchi. Yep. What happened there? Can you talk us through what sort of led to that event? Yeah, well, this cloaked in a bit of mystery, but I, I think the real story is, is simply that Roger was involved in heroin dealing with Nettie Smith, who was still with us but in jail for the rest of his life for murder and other bits and pieces. Smith at the time was Australia's biggest heroin dealer involved throughout the nation, just not Sydney, but no, Sydney was the heroin hub. The story I'm told, and I think it's pretty fair, is that he and Roger were in business. Roger was making sure they didn't get too many problems, blah, blah, blah. Warren Land Franchi was an accident looking for a location to happen. He was as wild as all get out. Again, a bloke from a really good family. Good parents, solid brothers, nice, decent people. Warren, as black as a sheep can get, is what Warren was. Um, Good looking and dangerous. He was portrayed in the old murder, Blue Murder series, reasonably accurately. Warren was selling for Nettie, but Warren was skimming. So Warren would get the supplies from Nettie to deliver to other clients. And the clients were saying to Nettie, hey, this stuff's been watered down. Mm. Nettie wasn't very happy. Roger wasn't very happy. Unhappy drug dealer clients are problematic, dangerous and violent, probably. So Warren needed a strong talking to. Warren signed his own death warrant, I reckon, when he decided, he was also doing armed holdups as well, and he decided to do an armed holdup in five, Doc, I think it was, Friday afternoon as usual, usual stuff, turns up just about to do the bank robbery, a young copper on a motorcycle, sees what's going on, rushes up to the car, Warren's just about to shoot him, or I think he may have let one go. And all of a sudden, Warren becomes public enemy number one in New South Wales. You do not shoot at a copper. Not on. That offends everybody, even the slightly greedy detectives at the CIB who didn't mind a few bucks in the back pocket. thought, no, nah, you can't do this. So Warren is in serious strife. I think it was a Saturday afternoon in June. Nettie Smith has, at, Warren, at uh, Roger's behest, arranged to meet Warren in Redfern to tell him that you've really got to calm down, mate. That was a story pitched to him. Warren Land Franchi at that point is um, living with... Uh, girl called Sally Ann Huckstep, heroin addict, prostitute. Again, from a great family, really solid people in the eastern suburbs, went to a nice school, educated, smart. Everyone assumed because she had a heroin problem and she was a sex worker that she probably wouldn't do anything. Boy, did they make a mistake. Warren goes out and eventually the meeting is set in Dangar Place in Chippendale. Spot's still there. There are armed, members of the armed hold-up squad surrounding the area. They don't know what's going down at that stage, but they know there's a potentially really dangerous meeting. Nettie then delivers Land Franchi to Dangar Place and takes a backward step. According to Roger, Warren Land Franchi pulls a pistol out of his pocket and is about to shoot him, so Roger pulls out his service revolver and shoots him mm. instead. Roger claims it's self-defence in the line of duty. A couple of months later, it goes to the coroner's court. 
the coroner's jury, which is unusual in those days to have a jury, reckon that it really it may have been self defence, but it wasn't in the line of duty. So the whole thing's uh. the whole thing is whiffy as all get out. Warren Lanfranchi walks directly towards me, and then when we got to, he got to about here, he kept walking into the lane, into Beaumont Street, heading towards Dengar Place, and I could see uh, a car coming down the hill, which I knew contained. Uh, Detective Sergeant Harding and Detective Rod Moore. Well, because at that point of time, he was very, very toey, absolutely jumping. So he, with that, he said words to the effect that, that it was an ambush, and I basically agreed with him. And because at that point of time, he then suddenly just backed around and pulled this gun out from these very tight trousers. And as he was bringing it up, I realised this bloke's going to shoot me. So I reached behind for my gun, and because I didn't mess around, and I brought it up and I fired one shot and then fairly quickly after that I fired a second shot and of course it killed him. Is he seen as a hero though? Because this is a this is a bad man. This yeah. is someone who's considered a criminal. So yeah. is his life not really considered as, as valuable as... Uh, that was how they were thinking it was going to pan out but Roger's thinking didn't work very well because it, this is a weird thing. An old mate of mine, Warren Owens, was at the Telegraph that afternoon preparing his stories for the Sunday Telegraph, he hears what's gone down. And as curiosity, my work partner and I were driving past at exactly the same time and we thought, oh, we'll go and give him a hand. No, thanks. We've got it contained. My mate from the Telegraph rings through and gets straight to Roger Rogerson, who gives him this great story. But my mate from the Telegraph was thinking, this doesn't make sense. So the front page of the telly the next morning was high noon. <laughs> uh, I thought, oh, God, give me a break. Um <laughs> But there was something whiffy about the story. No one ever believed fully that Roger was acting in self-defence. There were a lot of jokes around at the time which are based in fact that, you know, if he'd, how could you hide a pistol in the trousers Warren was wearing? They were so bloody tight. You just couldn't do it. So no one actually believed it. And all of a sudden, Roger, the great hero of Sydney, I mean, I've shot this bastard drug dealer, people are thinking, well, it's not quite hanging together. Then up comes Sally Ann Huckstep, who is on national television and in the papers. She speaks to Ray Martin, doesn't she? She speaks to everybody, Ray Martin particularly. And what they find is this person that was normally cast aside as a, as a bit of society's debris is smart and she doesn't take a backward step and she's swinging at Roger. And all of a sudden people are thinking, what the hell's going on? Is this as smelly as it is? Roger suddenly goes from sort of want to be hero to probably a villain. The whole thing smells to high heaven. It gets slightly worse. They go to the coroner's inquest and one of Sally's mates who knew what was going on as well, Lynn Woodward, mm. disappears. Wow. Never got to give evidence. Stories about town uh, that she was grabbed by Roger and Nettie in Alexandria, Alexandria Park and shot and buried or dumped. Has her body ever been found? No, no one's ever been. It's one of those enduring mysteries. Everyone's forgotten about Lynn, but um, she was a very brave human being. So you've got two women mm. standing up against the reputation of the best detective at the CIB. That's a pretty tough act. Was Sally scared? Oh, yeah. She was scared, but she was also extraordinarily brave. But you know, one of those, she had a moral choice. This is what Roger expected. she just go away, you know, understand she was one of those people that if you prodded her and told her to go away, she'd think, well, bugger that, let's go for it. And she did. And she, throughout her entire life, which unfortunately was somewhat brief after that, she consistently went after Rogers at every possible opportunity. And, and what kind of things was she saying about him? What was the truth that she wanted to get out? Utterly corrupt. Involved with Nettie Smith in the so-called blue, green light um, involved in drug trafficking with Nettie Smith and the man that actually shot as an execution her boyfriend, Warren Lanfranchi. Pretty hefty series of allegations back in those mm. days. And in the climate of the early 80s in Sydney too, things were changing. The press was starting to ask questions of what the police did. A bizarre confluence of circumstances. We had a Royal Commission into that caused the Premier, the Neville Rand, to stand down briefly because there are allegations of corruption everywhere. And all of a sudden, Sydney's starting to bubble. We had... Um, up until about oh, 81, 82, when Roger finally got into a bit of strife, Sydney was contained. We didn't ask questions. 
the coppers and the politicians are on the take and all the sort of crimes are covered up, people are thrown in jail wrongly. So we had the Rogerson appearance and people are asking questions. The National Times newspaper was asking all sorts of awful questions about what the police were doing and implying the corruption was widespread and deep and dangerous, even at the point that the politicians and the judiciary were involved. So Rogers' actions in shooting Warren Land Franchi that afternoon was pretty much a catalyst for a, oh, five or six years of serious rock and roll in this city. Mm. We finally woke up to the fact that the place was very whiffy. When the police become judge, jury, and executioner, then somebody has to speak. Somebody has to come forward. Somebody has to start somewhere and stop it. Did Warren try to take his gun that Saturday morning or Saturday lunchtime? Oh, God, no. We had $10,000, which we'd wrapped up into bundles with elastic bands right round. It was one big bundle. He put the money down the front of his pants and pulled his jumper down over the top of it. How do you know, Sally, that he didn't have a gun in the car, that he didn't pick it up on the, the path as he walked out, that he didn't have it planted somewhere? Because he left the gun at home and I had the gun. It was a 9mm Smith & West automatic pistol. And you had it after he left? No That's question. Right. No question. Now, you said that Sally's life wasn't too long after no. she uh, sort of testified against uh, Rogerson. Mm. What happened to her? What became of her? She was quite vocal for until I think it was about 86 she died. And they found her in Busby's Pond in Centennial Park one early one morning, dead. She'd been, I think, asphyxiated and dumped in the water and floated up. There's a bit of a theme there. Um, she got a phone call. She was staying with a friend in Edgecliff. Um, she got a call to go and meet somebody that night. Um, she'd gone to Centennial Park to meet this person, and that was it. There are three people, I'll be polite about who they are, uh, red-hot suspects for arranging to have her meet them there and killing her. And is Rogerson implicated at all? No, Rogerson, Roger, Roger was very quick to point out that he had an alibi. And his alibi was he was, I think, at the Maryland's bowling club drinking with a couple of coppers or, and quipped, and this is the Rogerson, such a humour, sparkling as ever, quipped that he got into a bit of strife from his wife when he got home drunk about you know, 1 a.m. That's a good story. The only problem with it is, is that if you look closely at the testimony of witnesses, they can't say specifically that it was that night. They think it was, but they're not 100% certain. They've opened the door slightly to sneak back through it if there's a problem. One of the tantalising pieces of evidence from the scene was that they found a car with a handprint on it. And I was always thinking, is that Roger's handprint? But it wasn't. Right. So... Look, I think for my money, Roger is utterly complicit in the arrangement. Sally Ann was, she was the architect of his downfall. Mm. And being a somewhat sexist bastard as Roger is, it would have really galled him. I believe that Rogerson had had enough, that he said that she had to go. He wanted her dead. He was being groomed for bigger and greater things. And, you know, I think that, was a big part of his his anger and resentment towards my mother. He was being groomed, you know, probably to be police commissioner, the way he was going. And once my mother spoke up, well, that was going to be a little bit difficult. Now, you knew Roger Rogerson, didn't you? We bumped into each other a few times. And what was he like as a person? How would you describe him? When I met him as a young detective, he was great. Really utterly charming. I was at the CIB and Rogerson was the sort of bloke you'd bump into him in the lift or in the foyer or something or other. He'd remember who you were. He's got that politician's touch. Mm. Always smiling, utterly charming, make a joke, shake hands, bit of a laugh. How's it all going? How's it going? Are you working with so-and-so? A bit of a deadbeat. Um, all that sort of stuff. Immediately delightful. But he'd remember who you were. So every time you bumped into him, you got the same camaraderie and you thought, this guy's pretty bloody good. But I remember when... After the Land Franchi debacle and Roger was transferred to Darlinghurst because it was a bit quieter, good luck with that. Darlinghurst in those days was far from quiet, but someone thought that was a good idea. I remember coppers used to cash their paychecks at a pub on a 
Wednesday night, every second Wednesday, and the publican, aided by the armed hold-up squad, would drive to the bank and come back with his bags of money so he could cash the paychecks over the bar. And Roger was always at the pub those nights, cashing his paycheck and the centre of everyone's attention. Everyone wanted to be drinking with Roger. So he was well liked? Ah, oh, loved, venerated almost. Everyone wanted to be drinking with him. They wanted to be in his orbit because he was the ascendant detective of his generation, the man marked to be commissioner maybe. But after Lan Franchi and things started getting really ratty, it was fascinating. Roger would walk in and everyone would turn and look the other way. Mm. So he had a couple of mates with him but very few. It was interesting. Coppers are quite political. They they know if you throw a dead cat in the room, they know where to, what to do with it. And Roger was looking a bit like the dead cat in the bar. So in 1986, he was officially dismissed. Yep. Why? What was it that was eventually the catalyst for him getting out? Oh, it was a whole range of things with Roger, but it basically under the police regulations of the time, if they were behaving in an unbecoming fashion, uh, that's the polite version, um, they could get rid of you. And that's what they did with Roger. They, they broke him down sequentially. Things kept getting worse for Roger. He kept getting implicated in crimes he'd done. He kept bragging about money he'd got. He was caught on tapes in restaurants talking to two blokes prodding drug deals. Oh, was, there was a mountain of evidence. So the fastest way to get rid of him is they couldn't hang him criminally is to just departmentally charge him with being a bad egg and got rid of him. They also suggested, and the ultimate insult to him was to say to him, well, congratulations, we're going to send you back to Bankstown in uniform. And mm. that was that was just too much. So he gets, he's off sick and all that sort of stuff. He, and curiously enough, was under treatment at one stage by Dr. Bailey of the Chelmsford Hospital, which is a saga from the 80s, and this deep sleep therapy, which has just ruined so many lives. Roger didn't go, go for deep sleep therapy, just went for a bit of consultation and a medical certificate. Um, but he's threatened to go back to uniform. He goes off sick and all that sort of stuff. And eventually they departmentally charge him and say, congratulations, the Commissioner Longer has faith in you. See you later. So he lives in New South Wales Police Force under a major cloud. No superannuation, no benefits, no nothing. Get out. A 28-year career in the police force could soon be over for Detective Roger Rogerson following a ruling today from the police tribunal recommending his dismissal. The controversial detective was found guilty of seven misconduct charges. His future will now be decided by the commissioner. But the most serious charge against Rogerson was the opening of two false bank accounts involving a total of $111,000. Rogerson claimed the money had come from the restoration and sale of a Bentley. But rejecting the argument, Judge Thorley said the inference was overwhelming the money was in some way tainted. In summing up, he said, the community is entitled to have confidence in the police force and its members. What has been shown here is a betrayal of that entitlement. Rogerson wouldn't comment on today's findings. It's now up to Commissioner Avery to decide his future. If Mr Avery follows the judge's advice in dismissing Rogerson, the former detective stands to lose a considerable amount in superannuation after 28 years service. When he was out of the force, yep. his profile didn't didn't go away, uh, and he had a lot to do with the media. Yep. Alan Jones defended him, didn't he? Alan Jones defended him years later. Roger loved the media. Roger did learn. I think Ray Martin also gave him a hell of a mauling one day. It was a young event. It was, a, it was one of those interviews you're watching and thinking, mate, you really shouldn't have done this. Yeah. Because all of a sudden the great performer is got another great performer sharing the stage and he's nailed. Before Roger got charged with lying to the Police Integrity Committee, Alan Jones would pump him up as being, we need more Roger Rogersons. Yeah, right. What did he mean by that? Oh, it was when they were banging on about law and order. Every couple of years you get the law and order debate, you know, arrest more people, throw more people in jail as if it works. It hasn't worked in generations. Jones was saying, you know, we need to sort these people out. Blokes like Roger would do it, you know, fearless, tough detectives. Fearless, tough detectives. But, you know, Alan, admit the part that they're bent as a dog's hind leg. Don't worry about that. Is Alan. it almost like a Ned Kelly complex? Like, yeah. was there a moment where Roger Rogerson almost represented the person who was going after the bad guys? Yep. Is that what he represented yeah. for some? And he marketed that as well. Yeah, right. He, he picked that. He Roger was a great networker, politically very active. People loved him. He courted the media. There were so many journalists in Sydney that he was their 
principal source on so many great stories. So Roger got himself a Teflon coating for a lot of years. Even the shit that happened in the late 80s, uh, from Warrenland Franchi through to the Sally Ann Huckstep and Christopher Dale Flannery going missing, which Roger's got his fingerprints all over, he managed to get away with it. He'd been to jail for lying to a court a couple of times and Alan Jones is still saying, we need more men like Roger Rogerson. Well, good luck with that, Alan. Alan's last outing as a Roger supporter was Roger wrote a book called The Dark Side, I think from memory, self-published. He decides to have a book launch. And this is, he's such a showman. And I think it's about uh, 2012 or something or other. He has the book launch at the um, Iron Duke Hotel, which was famous because Nettie Smith owned it and there are allegedly bullet holes mm. in the cellar where Roger and Nettie were doing target practice. And Roger outed Nettie on national television as an informant. And a day later, some likely lad decides to run Nettie over outside his own pub. So the, the hotel has a lot of history, so you can see why they thought it was amusing to have it there. Alan Jones's Master of Ceremonies, he launches the book, does the great Roger Rogerson, wah, rah, rah. And everyone's thinking, yeah, yeah, isn't Roger great? You know, a flawed but great hero. Then when he gets arrested for Jamie Gow's arrest, Alan Jones suddenly says, well, I didn't really know him. Really? Mm. So he backtracked? Oh, yeah, Alan, Alan Jones's story, and I just I put it politely, as I was just doing it because I'd been asked to, I don't know much about what's going on at all. I thought, okay, Alan's fine, you know. I was the talking head, brought along for the day. And so it's in 2014 that he's convicted of the murder of Jamie Gow. Uh, 2016. 2016, yeah, 2014 yeah. is when the murder happened. Yeah, we had we had two years of high farce in our courts. And what was the mess in the courts? Because that took a really long time, didn't it? And then there was yeah. a misstep by Charles Waterstreet and... <laughs> 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 yes, yes. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Water Street may have been one of the... Um, <sighs> Hurdles? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, murder trials normally don't get to court all that quickly to a hearing because simply because there's a lot of preliminary steps and getting a slot for a murder trial that's going to last three months isn't that easy. Uh, Roger was arrested in May 2014. They were due to go to trial, I think, in July 2015. That's right, I was up at court watching. That's when... Charlie Water Street decided some Instagram and social media posts might be a good idea. So the jury was just impaneled. The judge was not particularly pleased. So they had to discharge the jury. And then there was a sort of, can we get a jury back for September of 2015? And so, judges are loath to have a jury impaneled over a Christmas break because you know, obvious reasons people forget, their memories fail, they've got family commitments, all that sort of stuff. So you don't start a long trial in September unless it's utterly unavoidable. So thanks to that hullabaloo, the trial then goes over and commences in February of 2016. Set down for three months and it ran pretty much three months. It was a really long, complicated criminal trial. More drama happened during it because about, oh, about four weeks in, I think, from memory, Sunday afternoon, I get a phone call from someone saying, oh, you better get to court tomorrow. Something's going on. We get to court the next day. And McNamara's barrister and solicitor withdraw from the case. And we can't comment on why that happened. There were various reasons for it. Uh, this wasn't Water Street. This is a subsequent legal team, mm. a particularly you know, decent, honourable and capable combination. So all of a sudden, the trial goes into hiatus. We're in the middle of the trial. The jury's impaneled. McNamara is unrepresented. Oh, it's a mess. Beautifully handled by the judge, I have to say, and the, um, the two remaining counsel, the prosecutor and, and uh, Roger's counsel. It could have gone completely off the rails, but they managed to get it back on the rails, thank goodness, and the trial kicked on. So it was a convoluted case. And what was Rogerson's sentence? What was he sentenced to? Life. Both he and Glenn McNamara, they were convicted of acting in a joint criminal enterprise. Their stories at court was... He did it. And mm. They were pointing at each other. They think, come on, guys, they're in the same room. Bad luck. So the strategy of both sides was to try and isolate them and having painting the picture of one as being the bad guy and the other as an innocent who just got duped. McNamara always said that Roger did it and gave us his great evidence. I remember one afternoon talking about how Roger had admitted all the other people he'd killed and there's this great long laundry list of people Roger had bragged about murdering. Roger says that for his worth, he turned up to give his mate grandfatherly advice. Mm. No one believed them. 
I think for me the part that nailed them, apart from the CCTV and everything else, the part that got me most, and I got the jury as well, we're sitting in court and they're playing the CCTV footage and they've just got through the grisly bit of Glenn and Roger who've been to a higher place to get the block and tackle to lift Jamie into the boat for disposal the next morning. They've done all that. You, there's CCTV of them sort of rummaging around in the garage. And then we cut to the lift. And after the hard day's work is done, they're in the lift at Glenn's apartment in Cronulla and they've got a six-pack of beer. Wow. And you're going to see the beer with great clarity and everyone in the courtroom goes, oh! And that's, I think, the moment they really got convicted. Yeah. Just the cold-bloodedness of it. Um, no, neither of them were looking furtive. They looked like they needed a drink after a hard day's work. And it's just one of those simple moments that ices the cake for yeah. the prosecution. It almost is a signal of a lack of remorse. There's yeah. something so yeah. like this is an ordinary night yeah. about having, having you know, a drink at the exactly. end of the day. And that sort of put pay to their, well, I was coerced. No, he did it. He did it. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. This puts them in the same list about to go and have a beer together. And uh, it's just that one simple frame of film that screwed them hard. The evidence presented during the four-month trial was overwhelming. Security cameras covering almost every move. One camera recorded three men entering a storage unit in the Sydney suburb of Padstow, but only two came out, dragging a body with them. The next morning, another camera captured the men taking McNamara's boat out to sea, where they dumped Gal's body. It was recovered by police six days later. You've dedicated so much time to sort of analysing and examining the life of Roger. Mm. Would you call him evil? Yes, utterly. So not a complicated man who was a, you know, a, trying to be a hero but was imperfect. You would use the word evil? Well, I just don't think he cares. I've met him recently, uh, again, after years. I mean, he, he once threatened to... Uh, Okay, have you whacked? I thought, oh, yeah, right, good. By phone, mind you. But the last time I met him, and I met him in prison briefly just for a chat, um, he was the other Roger. So you've got these two things. You've got the utterly evil, cold-blooded executioner who was motivated by money and power more than anything else. And then you've got the utterly charming bloke who you just want to spend time with. And we're sitting in prison talking. And... <sighs> You could have transplanted it to the pub that he used to like in back of Bankstown. You'd be sitting there having a beer each and a chat like two old mates. Mm. That's how good he is. The eyes work. He, he's got that actor's ability to make you feel as though you're the only person in the room or the theatre. You're sitting and there might be 2,000 people around you, but they're talking to you. That's Roger's trick and it's beautiful. And he's still got it. But behind that, that's all the facade. He's also utterly ruthless. And the final thing I wanted to ask you was what you think the legacy of this sort of corruption and what he's done to the police force. Do you think this has sort of permanently affected the way that, you know, the standing of New South Wales police and the way that civilians trust or perhaps don't the police yeah, force? Yeah, I actually, in the short term, I could see it was very destabilising. Yeah. This is, I'm talking about the 80s when all this hullabaloo was breaking loose. Um, the long term, I think, um, and it goes back in part to the um, fearlessness of Sally Ann Huckstep uh, and the journalists who finally started picking the story up and changed the way we perceive police. I think the, it's been a great benefit to the New South Wales Police Force. You layer that on top of the Royal Commission that followed in the mid nineties. Um, it changed how it changed their culture substantially. There will always be crooks in policing, um, particularly in. Um, with drug crimes. I mean, if you, you walk into a room and there's 500,000 bucks in a plastic bag, you think, hmm. yeah. Some coppers will say it goes into the exhibit room. Other coppers will think, well, maybe they won't miss a bit. And it's, it's a challenge for anyone, that amount of money and the ease of getting away with it. But I think Rogerson's downfall uh, had a massive benefit for New South Wales policing. It's not the corrupt organisation it was. Corruption isn't accepted as being part of the day, game. And I think that's a huge benefit. I don't know whether Roger would see it that way. 
it feels like there's a sense now of of knowing that they need to be more accountable and the fact that it was unpicked by people from the outside i think there does seem to be a higher standard and the public sort of is more invested in in what they're doing, it's not as insular as the Sydney you described perhaps in the 70s. It, but, well, back in those days, it, it, the coppers were incredibly influential. They were involved with politicians, corrupt lawyers, and you know, allegations of corrupt members of the judiciary. So it was a big club. Mm. Um, I think the legacy of that Rogerson leaves is that you can't get away with blue murder anymore. Absolutely. Thank you so much for speaking to us. That was so enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. The joint criminal enterprise to which each offender was a party was extensive in its planning, brutal in its execution, and callous in its aftermath. Roger Caleb Rogerson, in respect of the offence of supplying a prohibited drug, you are sentenced to a non-parole period of nine years imprisonment commencing on the 27th of May 2014 and concluding on the 26th of May 2023 in respect of the offence of the murder of Jamie Gow. You are sentenced to life imprisonment commencing on the 27th of May 2014. The offenders are to be removed immediately, please. You can find Duncan McNabb's book titled Roger Rogerson at all good bookstores and online. For pictures relating to the case and links to police statements and case findings, join our closed Facebook group. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper. <laughs>